It takes two. Amy Eiler, JJ Gordon on the Mighty 790 KFGO. Well, if you want to make your Labor Day weekend a little more presidential, or more specifically, a little more first lady-ish, <laughs> well, good news. On the line, we've got Andrew Oak. He is the first ladies' man. You've heard him on our airwaves before. This man knows everything that there is to know, and then a little bit more about the first ladies of the United States. He's got two amazing books. They both sit on my bookshelf at home. Andy, welcome back to the Mighty 790 KFGO. JJ, Amy, so great to be back with you guys here. Creeping up on a holiday weekend. Uh, weather's beautiful here in Shadyside, Maryland. Hoping the same for you. I know I got some Maryland friends uh, out visiting. Uh, Andrea Samari's out there with Christy and has having a time. <laughs> I promise a shout out to those two. Love I know it. they're listening <laughs> and all your other regular friends and listeners. It's just fantastic to be here with you. Well, before we got on the air, I said to Andrew off the air, I said, I think we're keeping Miss Andrea here maybe forever. We're starting a petition for her to just stay in Fargo forever. And he said, okay, just send her back for my cookout. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. We need we need her smile, her hilarity, um, Sadie, her dog, Allie, her husband, and, and her deviled eggs. Oh, and I've heard her spaghetti sauce is amazing. She offered it to it's another incredible. local news personality. I don't know I why... I don't know why I didn't get in on that, but um, I'll be begging her for some for sure. Okay, so this time it's a little bit different than we've usually done when chatting with Andrew. And by the way, you can get his books. You can look him up, firstladiesman.com. We actually decided to feature you in our Foodie Friday segment. Foodie Friday is right sponsored by Prime Cut Meats. Stop in today and get everything you need for grilling this weekend on University Drive in Fargo. You can check out their weekly specials at primecutmeatsfm.com. But we wanted to feature you because... You know, not only do you know everything there is to know about the First Ladies, but you also know about their cooking habits. And, uh, w well, on your website, I was digging around, and I saw that you mentioned that you you couldn't name the best cook amongst the First Ladies, but you definitely know the worst one. <laughs> well, yeah. No, it's funny. And, and I was going to say, I can talk about their their cooking uh, uh, talents and lack thereof. Um, it's, it's, it's funny. And I'm, I'm, I'm thumbing through my, um, I'll throw a shout out to all my friends at the national women's history museum here in Washington, DC. They published a cookbook a couple of years back. And when I, um, I went on, uh, and did a live webcast on their, on their, uh, uh, and, and, uh, nwhm.org, uh, website. We did a, we did an in office cooking segment that they're still talking about today because we almost burned the building down. I, I'm, I'm exaggerating, of course. That's how the, the years have have emphasized and exaggerated the story. But we were we were cooking um, uh, some waffles and pancakes from a first lady's recipe book, and it just smoked up in the air. I, I honestly, I cannot believe the sprinklers didn't go on, and and we <laughs> the, the, we didn't foresee all of that happening. But there was a little hot plate in there. I mean, it was all safe and all, but. One of the one of the dishes produced a, a quite a bit of smoke as I think we were kind of just prepping the pan with with butter and things like that. I honestly I cannot believe. And so now in the history books of the National Women's History Museum, the first ladies man and the staff there almost burned the building down in Virginia cooking uh, someone's <laughs> someone's uh, flapjacks or something along those lines. But I, you know I've got some really funny stories, some interesting things from, that I learned along the way as we did learn. You know, the C-SPAN series and me and now us together in the books and everything about these first ladies. There were some first ladies that had very, very unique specialty dishes that their presidential husbands, like, died for. They are just, like, just would love it. Jane Pierce is, is sort of a below-the-fold first lady and, by all accounts, very, very dour, rightfully so. A lot of tragedy in her life. But one of the highlights in her dark, dark life was she always had sugar cookies on hand. For um, uh, for Franklin Pierce, and he was in the U.S. Congress before he was president. He fought in the Mexican American War, did a lot of traveling as a lawyer. And whenever he came home from work or war or politics or whatever, Jane Pierce had fresh, warm sugar cookies right out of the oven for him. Um, Mary Lincoln was famous for her white cake. There's a white cake recipe recipe of Mary Lincoln that you can buy. It's basically like a vanilla cake with with white icing. But, but um, uh, Abraham Lincoln loved it and made sure that she put that out at every single in-house campaign event at their home in Springfield, Illinois, when all of the townspeople and the, 
and the uh, political elite would come through to have a chance to shake his hand and chat with him as they made the circuit through their house. They had a, a double parlor system that Mary designed specifically for politicking and running for office. And as they came through the kitchen, they would get this lovely slice of, of white cake that she had made, among other things. Ooh, I mean, that. that sounds great. And I mean, so much of what we know about the White House are, you know, these big state dinners where they've got a huge crew of people who are cooking and serving. Sure. But I have to imagine a lot of these uh, women were, were wives, they they were mothers, and they probably at one point wanted to cook for themselves, just like I always hear that presidents also want to drive for themselves every now and then. Sure. Where they say, they like, want a little I normalcy. Need... Right, exactly. Well, you know, it's interesting that you say that, just sticking with Mary Lincoln for a second. When they were in Springfield, Illinois, and, and Abe first started getting his foot in the door with it being a corporate lawyer uh, for the railroad system, was, was making some coins. They, they bought a stove, and this stove was a big deal. The stove is still there, by the way, in the Lincoln home, and they bought it and paid. I think they paid, I mean, it was. It ended up to be like $250, but that was like the salary for their housekeeper for the entire year. It was extremely, extremely opulent, and Mary Todd comes from wealth, and Abe, she even said, you know, he's not the best-looking and the richest guy in town, but he's going to be president, so I'm going to hitch my – my horse to his wagon. It was really part of her decision making when she married Abe. But she was crying to Abe. She was she was inconsolable. She didn't know how they were going to move her new stove to the White House when he got elected president. And Abe Lincoln reportedly said to her, he said, "It's okay, Mary dear. I think they've got a stove at the White House. We're going to be okay." And they ended up leaving the stove there in 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 Illinois. But another, you know, these women are so instrumental in. In the political process, we're right in the middle of the of the campaign season and all that, and we see these women out doing the politicking and campaigning. In many instances, they've been surrogate uh, campaign managers and things in the past. Um, but but uh, the last successful front porch presidential campaign was Warren Harding in Marion, Ohio. And when that happened, a front porch campaign is exactly what it sounds like. The, the candidates stay in their home. And people would travel. I mean, tens of thousands of people would travel to these remote, tiny little towns to camp out and stay as the presidential candidate, their favorite, would come out and speak on his front porch. Well, when the Hardings did this, the press corps set up in the Harding shed. Like they had a, they had a wire done by Bell Atlantic or AT&T or whoever the company was. So they could wire out these stories. It was it was literally plugged into the shed behind the Harding's house, and that's where the press office was. And they stayed and camped out in the yard and things. And Florence Harding had a very special waffle recipe. And each morning she would come out and bring waffles to the press corps. I mean, it's like you know, people get hungry. A, a, a well-fed press is a happy press, and they'll write more favorably about you know your husband when they're sitting on a pile of waffles, homemade waffles, when they're stuck basically living in a shed in the side yard. So these women and their cooking and these recipes have been instrumental in, in indirectly in getting some of these men elected. Okay, so Mamie Eisenhower, you mentioned, has yeah. a fudge recipe. It, she's famous for it. Now, this is the funny story behind Mamie Eisenhower. I'm, I'm, flipping, I'm flipping through the book because I know it will be here in this the um, uh, uh, Mamie's Million Dollar Fudge. I can I can briefly read down the ingredients. Okay. It's four and a half cups of sugar, a pinch of salt, two tablespoons of butter, one 12-ounce can of evaporated milk, semi-sweet chocolate chips, German sweet chocolate, one pint of marshmallow cream, and two cups of nuts. And Mamie is known for this. Mamie's Million Dollar Fudge. But here's the funny story behind it. Mamie Eisenhower, also similar to Mary Lincoln, coincidentally, came from privilege, and her husband did not. Ike was a poor farm boy and rose through the military ranks and success all the way up to the presidency, one of our most beloved and successful presidents in history. Mamie Eisenhower, instrumental in the women's vote when the women first outnumbered the men in the electorate. In, and, and the campaign paraphernalia for Mamie, incredible. But these, this wealthy beginning that she started with, with the Dowds, her parents, her father was in meatpacking and shipping and all this just kind of crazy wealth. 
in in that early early uh, early twentieth uh, century America. And her mother told her, she said, "Mamie, if you learn how to cook, people are going to want you to cook. So if you don't like to cook." <laughs> Don't learn to cook. So Mamie took this to heart, and apparently Mamie did not like to cook. But Mamie was a, 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 a doting mother and even more so grandmother, and she loved to cook fudge for her children and grandchildren. So she knew how to make two things. She knew how to make fudge, and she knew how to make mayonnaise. And that's it. <laughs> and you can Google right now Dwight Eisenhower White House cooking, and you can see him on the roof of the portico he had a grill out there, and maybe would sit back with their Manhattans on the rocks, watching Ike flip steaks and burgers and entertaining, just like they had done in all the military, um, uh, um, um, in all of the officers' uh, uh, housing that they lived in and whatever, and had all the other officers and officers' wives over for dinners and stuff. Mamie was the quintessential host, but it's Ike who's always out there flipping flipping the burgers and flipping the steaks and turning the hot dogs and stuff. I love it. That is a woman after my own heart. Someone just texted in Andrew Oak. It is, he is the First Ladies Man. You can find him and his books at firstladiesman.com. Did Pat Nixon have a favorite recipe? This person says, I've heard her say before, I am not a cook. That joke I'm is looking- top notch, by the way. You know, because it's Nixon. Like, I'm not a crook. Oh, and she's saying, I'm not, like, this I joke did not get this it is so good. layered. So layered. <laughs> Such a layered joke. I didn't. I saw it, it come is. in, and I was it's, like, oh. That's it's funny. Only, it's, only, it's only layered as high as Mary Lincoln's white cake, I assure you. <laughs> um, uh, 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 in here, in the, the White House, it, it, it is. She did have a recipe. That look, um, um, uh, Pat Nixon has a meatloaf. And I'm a big mm. meatloaf fan. Got to love meatloaf. Mm. And it's got garlic and finely chopped onions, three slices of white bread in there, lean ground beef, eggs, salt, pepper, parsley, rime, majorum. I'm not saying that right. Maybe I am. Majorum, a uh, teaspoon of t- tomato puree and breadcrumbs. Sounds absolutely delicious. The garlic and onions are going to make that for me. Um, but, yeah, Pat Nixon Pat Nixon would make a White House, uh, make, a, make a meatloaf. Now, here's an interesting aspect of the Nixon. You know, we talk about him being a crook. And all. The, um, the, the, the Watergate was probably hardest on, on Pat Nixon. Pat was, as much as Mamie was the quintessential military wife and, and hostess, Pat Nixon was the quintessential political wife. She stood by her man no matter what, regardless. She also quietly collected more artifacts and antiques for the White House collection than any other first lady in history to date. Wow. So when you walk through the White House now, uh, Melania Trump is opening the tours back up. I saw uh, starting this month, middle of September, which everyone's very excited about, obviously socially distant and all the precautions that we have to do where they feel they can do this safely. Um, But when you walk through that White House, the collection that that Jacqueline Kennedy started, you know, made it as a, uh, a national historic landmark. But, but after Mrs. Kennedy did that, Mrs. Nixon is the one who quietly, very, very quietly collected more artifacts and antiques for that collection than any other first lady. So you walk in there, and it's Pat Nixon you have to thank for so many of those pieces of furniture and that, and that artwork that's throughout the house. Um, but uh, uh, Pat Nixon and Richard Nixon started off, they met in a little theater group. In uh, outside of Yorba Linda, California, in Southern California. And Nixon said on their first date that he knew he was going to marry her. A lot of these guys really fell head over heels for these women. LBJ comes to mind. Uh, George W. Bush uh, comes to mind. Um, some of these great love stories that are in that these guys knew immediately the type of natural aptitude, intelligence, and what these women had to bring to the table and, and just fell in instantly in love with them. And the early, the early uh, courtship dating letters and correspondence back and forth that are in the Nixon collection are just truly endearing. They, they almost, more than any other presidential couple in history, had a just completely separate private life than their public life. Pat Nixon was, 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 was uh, called Plastic Pat in person because she just stood there with no reaction, no emotion, no this, but her, she was also the most traveled first lady and second lady of her time going to places that, that, that she went to leper colonies in South America to spread goodwill and humanitarian efforts without much fanfare. 
she really didn't need all the promotion and stuff. She just wanted to do the good work because it was the right thing to do. Well, Andy, don't give all the book away. We want to get people to buy your, <laughs> buy know, your books. <laughs> and, uh, Andrew Oak is the First Ladies Man. Find him and his books. Order them today at firstladiesman.com. And if you're interested in any of these recipe books from the First Ladies, you can visit womenshistory.org. The National Women's History Museum has those as well. Andrew, thanks so much for your time. We always appreciate it. Always a pleasure, guys. Everyone out there, have a wonderful, safe Labor Day weekend, and I know I'll be talking to you again soon. Deal.